My name is Sophia Flynn. I'm a sophomore at Georgetown Visitation Preparatory School, and today I'll be talking to you a little bit about the RSA encryption algorithm and its strength in today's world. So to start off, what is RSA encryption? RSA encryption is an asymmetric form of cryptography. The best way to describe the differences between asymmetric and symmetric cryptography is through an example. Imagine that you have a box that has an important message in it that you'd like to send to your friend. You lock the box using a key and then send the locked box to your friend. They unlock the box using the identical key that you use to lock the box. What I've just described is a simplified version of symmetric encryption. Now imagine that your friend buys a padlock and a key that opens the padlock. He sends you the open padlock but keeps the key. You lock the box containing your secret message using the padlock your friend sent you. Then you send the locked box to your friend. He unlocks the box and reads your secret message using the key that he originally bought. This, this scenario describes asymmetric key encryption. In asymmetric key encryption, identical keys do not have to be shared between you and your friend, and the key that your friend uses to unlock the box containing your secret message is kept private throughout the entire process. RSA encryption is an asymmetric encryption that works a lot like the latter example I described, making it exceedingly safe because no keys are exchanged that could potentially be intercepted. In the 1970s, these three men, Ron Rivest, Eddie Shamir, and Leonard Edelman, were able to develop a, a, a mathematical algorithm that would put the conceptual idea of asymmetric key encryption into action. This was the beginning of RSA encryption. So how does the mathematical mechanics of all of this work? First of all, two prime numbers, P and Q, are selected by the key generator, the person who's creating the public and private encryption keys. The key generator then multiplies these two prime numbers, P and Q, together to get N. The phi of N is then calculated and called phi N. I'll return to what the phi function is in a little bit. E is then calculated. This value of E is what will be used to encrypt a message. The value that E has depends on the value of phi n. E must satisfy the requirement of being greater than 1 and less than phi n. It also cannot share any common factors with phi n. This means that E can be many numbers. It isn't limited to one certain number. It simply has to satisfy this requirement of being greater than 1 and less than phi n and sharing no factors with phi n. D is then calculated. The value that D has is what will be used to to decrypt an encrypted message. D depends on the value of E and phi n. In this case, D must satisfy the requirement of E times D mod phi n equals 1. I'll return to what mod, M-O-D, is in a while. Since we don't have a requirement like we had with E that allows for several values of E to be possible, D is only capable of being one certain number. There's not a range of numbers that D can be. So the public key. The values of N and E will be available to everyone. They'll be a part of the public key and anyone can access them. You can think of these values as the padlock that I described earlier. The private key. The values of P, Q, Phi N, N, and D will all be a part of the private key. They won't be available to anyone except the person who generated them. You can think of these as the key that unlocks the padlock. To start off the key generation, the key generator picks two prime numbers called P and Q. Prime numbers are simply numbers that have no factors except themselves and one. For example, seven is a prime number because the only factors it has are one and seven. Now, if this were a real world example, P and Q would be huge, huge prime numbers. In fact, RSA encryption gets a lot of its strength from using such huge prime numbers, and we'll see why in a while. In our example, we'll pick two relatively small numbers to make things easier on ourselves. We'll set our first prime number P to 11 and our second prime number Q to 13. N is then calculated by multiplying the two prime numbers that we picked together. In other words, N equals P times Q. In our example, P equals 11 and Q equals 13. Therefore, N equals 11 times 13, so N equals 143. The phi of a number outputs how many integers are less than the number that do not share any common factors greater than one with the number. 
For example, if I wanted to find the phi of 9, I'd list all of the integers less than 9 all the way to 1, including 9 itself. I would look at each number and see which ones share factors with 9 and which ones don't. One can see that 9, 6, and 3 share factors with 9, while 8, 7, 5, 4, 2, and 1 do not share any factors with 9 that are greater than 1. Since there are six numbers that 9 does not share a factor greater than 1 with, phi of 9 equals 6. Phi of any number is time consuming to compute except in the case of prime numbers, because in the case of non-prime numbers, finding phi of a number requires listing all of the integers before the number and determining if they share any factors with the number. Say you wanted to find the phi of 53, a prime number. The phi of 53 would simply be 52, because there are 52 numbers before 53 that do not share a factor greater than 1 with 53. This comes from the definition of a prime number. This leads to the conclusion that the phi of any prime number is simply the prime number minus 1. Since phi is multiplicative, we can say that phi n equals p minus 1 times q minus 1, keeping in mind that p and q are both prime, so their phi's will simply be one less than their actual value. In mathematical lingo, this process represents a trapdoor one-way function. This is a type of function that is easy to compute in one direction, but hard to compute in the opposite direction, unless you have information called the trapdoor. It's easy to compute phi n if you know the factorization of n, which is p, and q, p times q. In our example, n is 143, and we know that its factors are p and q, or 11 and 13. Therefore, it's easy for us to compute phi n. We would simply plug in values based on the equation phi n equals p minus 1 times q minus 1. However, it would be exceedingly difficult to find the values of p and q if we were simply given the value of n. If n equal 3,233, for instance, we would know that whatever the phi of 3,233 has to equal p minus 1 times q minus 1, but we can't solve an equation with two unknown variables. We would have to resort, resort to manually finding the factors of 3,233 and then plugging those factors p and q into the expression p minus 1 times q minus 1 to get phi n. The bigger n is, the more time it will take to find its factors, even with a computer, because even the computer would have to result to some form of trial and error to calculate p and q. n is sometimes so big that if you're trying to find its factors, it can actually take decades or even centuries to calculate. Here we begin to see why it's important to use prime numbers in RSA encryption. They connect to the phi function and make it easy to compute in one direction, because the phi of any prime number is easy to compute, but hard to solve for p and q in the opposite direction if only given the value of n. The bigger these prime numbers are, the bigger their product n will be. Since n is available to everyone, but p and q are only available to the person who generated them, a hacker who's trying to find n is in for a very long wait, even with a powerful supercomputer. Finding the factors of n, if n is a huge number, will take a very long time. In our example, phi n equals 11 minus 1 times 13 minus 1, or 120. So e. e is the value that will be used to encrypt a message. It must satisfy the requirement of 1 less than e less than phi n and must share no factors with phi n. This means that e can be a series of numbers. It isn't limited to one number. In our example, e must satisfy the requirement of 1 less than e less than 120, and e cannot share any factors with 120, since 120 is what we determined phi n to be in our previous example. There are many numbers that can satisfy this requirement, one of which includes 7. 7 is greater than 1 and less than 120. 7 also does not share any factors with 120. Therefore, 7 is a viable option for e. So d. D is the value that will be used to decrypt a message. Calculating it involves an operation called modulus. First of all, modulus is an, is an operation that outputs the remainder of a division. If I carry out the operation 8 divided by 6, I get a remainder of 2. So 8 mod 6 equals 2. Mod simply outputs the remainder of a division. The value of d must satisfy the requirement of e times d mod phi n equals 1. In this case, it can only be one number. This equation, e times d mod phi n equals 1, is the second trapdoor one-way function in RSA encryption, except in this case, the function connects modular arithmetic with the phi function. 
If you remember, a trapdoor one-way function is a type of function that is easy to compute in one direction, but hard to compute in the opposite direction, unless you have information called a trapdoor. It's easy to compute e times d mod phi n equals 1 if you have the value of e as well as phi n, which is your trapdoor information. However, since only e is available to the public and not phi n, it's hard to compute d without the value of phi n, which is a part of the public key. Sorry, private key. N is part of the n is part of the public key, however. So if you really wanted to find phi n, you'd be stuck trying to find the factors of n, which, as I mentioned before, is exceedingly time-consuming the bigger n is. Therefore, a second trapdoor one-way function has been constructed, this time connecting the phi function with modular arithmetic. In our example, d turns out to be 103. So in our example, P, Q, Phi, N, and D are all a part of the private key. Only we, the key generators, can access them. N and E are both a part of the public key. Anyone can access them. So what do we do with all this information? Remember that N and E are a part of the public key. So this is what somebody who wants to send us a message will use to encrypt their message. They'll pick an integer message they'd like to encrypt and raise it to the E power. Then, they'll simplify the expression m to the e mod n. Whatever this result yields is called c for ciphertext message. As you can see, the person who wants to send us their secret message locked their message using e. They'll send this message back to us, the key generator, and we'll decrypt it using d. In our example, c equals 67 when our original message m is 89. So decrypting a message. When we, the key generators, receive c, we decrypt that ciphertext message by raising c to the d power. Then we'll simplify the expression c to the d mod n. Whatever the result of this is, is the original message that was sent to us. As you can see, we unlocked the ciphertext message using d. As you can also see, using this formula gave us the original message that was sent to us, 89. So what I've spent a great portion of this year doing is creating an app that calculates n, phi n, E and D based on two prime number inputs P and Q given by the app user. The app is also capable of encrypting and decrypting messages based on this information. As you can see on this first screen, the app asks the app user to input two prime numbers P and Q, which in this example have been entered in as 13 and 11. My app then calculates the product of P and Q, which is N. In this case, N turns out to be 143. Then, my app calculates phi n, which is 13 minus 1 times 11 minus 1, or 120. On the next screen, my app calculates e, which in this example has to be greater than 1 and less than 120, and can share no common factors with 120. A number that satisfies this requirement is 7. My app then calculates d, which in this example has to make the equation 7 times d mod 120 equal 1 true. D turns out to be 103. On the final screen, my app asks the app user to pick an integer message they'd like to encrypt. In this example, I've chosen 89 as this integer message. The app then encrypts 89 by raising it to the e power, which is 7, and then dividing this entire expression by n, which is 120, and then taking the modulus of this, this division and setting it to c for a ciphertext or encrypted message. In this case, c equals 67. The app then decrypts C to get the original message. It raises C to the D power, which is 103, divides this entire expression by N, which is 120, and then takes the modulus of this division, and then takes the modulus of this division. The modulus of this divi division is and should be the same as the integer message that was first selected to be encrypted, and it is, 89. So right now my app acts as a bit of an RSA encryption calculator, but in the future, I'd like to develop it into a teaching tool to teach people about the RSA encryption process, hopefully complete with the descriptions and easy to understand videos. Ultimately, my end goal is to teach people about the encryption that keeps so much of our information secure today. Thank you for listening. Are there any questions?
Thank you. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Is this app available right now? Uh, not yet, but I'm planning.